It's a segment of the show we call KSAT Q&A, and we take your questions and our questions to local experts about some of the major topics that are happening in the news right now. And certainly, COVID-19 continues to be a major topic, and we are glad to be joined by Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, an infectious disease doctor. Thank you for staying up late with us, doctor. And the first question is your reaction to the fact that we set a 24 hour record basically for the number of people tested positive for COVID-19, 638. We've got to take action. So here's my reaction, cover for COVID. What do I mean? Put your mask on. This is my Spurs mask. Okay, we need teamwork here. San Antonio, you're good at being a team. Let's go for it. We've got to cover our faces or we're not going to kick COVID out of this city. We've got to social distance. We've got to test smart. And we'll come back to that about who, what, where, when, how we should test. We need to answer the phone when the contact tracers call us. That's people who are calling from a 210 area code and then the prefix is 270. If you see 210, 270, that's probably a contact tracer from Metro Health calling you to let you know about an exposure. If we don't answer the phone, we can't do the contact tracing. We really need to do it. And finally, you got to stay out. What do you have to stay out of? You need to stay out of crowded places, bars, gyms, large indoor gatherings, anywhere where there's groups of people, especially if they're inside without masks on. And finally, stay out of the emergency room. That is the place you do not want to go and get your COVID test from because they are filling up with people that have symptoms. It's a place where you might get exposed. So if you need a test, you need to call 311, go to the city of San Antonio's website and find out where to get tested. Speaking of those tests, I, I want to ask you about that because so many people are in search of one right now. If you think you've been exposed, when is the best time to get that test? Should you wait a certain number of days or should you wait for symptoms or do you go as soon as you find out that you've been exposed? Clarify that for us. Yeah, viewer Selena actually asked that very question about her granddaughter. So Selena, that's a good timing on that question. And there's been some recent new information that helps us answer that question much with much better data, much better science than we were able to answer it even a few weeks ago. And the first and foremost is if you develop symptoms after an exposure, go get tested. Okay. On average, on average, that happens about five days. If you're going to get symptomatic, most people will get symptomatic around five days after exposure, but it could be up to 14 days. So get tested if you have symptoms or if you just haven't gotten any symptoms and you've had a known exposure, eight days. And why do I say eight days? We have now got some data that shows us if you get tested just one day after you were exposed, there is a 100% chance that your test will be negative and we'll wow. call it a false wow. negative because maybe you were somebody who was going to be infected, but you cannot figure that out on day one. By about day four after your exposure, that risk of a false negative drops a little bit, but not very much. There's still a chance, a 67% chance that you would have a false negative test on day four. So it turns out that you have to wait until day eight after your exposure to have the best chance of actually getting a positive test that's a true positive. At day eight, your false negative rate is about 20%, and then after that, it starts to go back up again. So we tell people, if you've had an exposure and you have no symptoms, you wait till you get symptoms or you wait until the eighth day, whichever comes first, and that's when you go get tested. All right, another viewer, Douglas, uh, asks, how does COVID affect an individual's health? Well, COVID can affect your health in many, many ways in the short term and the long term. In the short term, you've all heard the symptoms, and not everybody is going to get sick enough to go to the hospital, but those that do are experiencing real shortness of breath. It's a feeling of air hunger, and people actually kind of turn blue when they're going to sleep, and they may not realize right away that they, they are lacking air, that they're hypoxic, we say, low oxygen, um, but, but those people really need to go to the emergency room. Those are the ones we want to see in the emergency room if, if you're turning blue, if you're having air hunger. 
um, affects uh, coughing. It can affect your sense of smell and your sense of taste. They can go away. That can be an early sign. You can have gastrointestinal symptoms. You can have nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Um, now, the more severe cases, though, progress all the way to respiratory failure, meaning that you can no longer keep up with your body's oxygen requirements, even when you're breathing hard and fast and on a lot of oxygen. And those folks need to get a tube put down into their lungs. They usually have to be sedated, more or less put into a coma for a while with medications so the machines can breathe for them. We often have to turn people on their stomachs. Um, before or during their intubation to improve the aeration of their lungs. And then there's a whole slew of side effects or additional effects uh, of the virus on your blood vessels. We see blood clots. Uh, we see abnormal heart rhythms. Um, we see people having cardiac arrests. So, and, and there can be neurologic side effects. So people who get the really severe form of the disease are coping with multi-system organ problems, and some of them can be pretty long-lasting. You know, if they're fortunate to recover and get off that ventilator, um, they can still have a very long recovery period. Dr. Ruth, for so long, San Antonio had been watching the rest of the world go through this, and now it is here, now it is on our doorstep in, in, in a very real sense. Is there any way to predict if this, for, for us here locally, if this is going to be a wave or if this is going to be a tsunami? What do models say? Right, so there are several models that we've been looking at at UT Health Science Center and that UT, our colleagues at UTSA also have a model and um, they're not pretty right now. Um, they, they show that we are on a definite uptick. Um, one of the models shows us peaking in around um, mid to late August. Um, another model shows us just going, you know, straight up and up and up. And it depends uh, on a lot of factors. What the models show depend on what you, what assumptions you make. And here's some positive news. If we make changes, in other words, if we start masking and social distancing and following the instructions of the contact tracing um, and staying out of indoor gatherings, if we do that, we can flatten our curve back down. Now, I believe that the current surge will see us come flatten back down or come come back off that high high slope, but we could be then at risk for another surge in the fall, especially if we further relax restrictions, um, have people going to school, don't have a vaccine yet, and in that flu season, we would also expect a resurgence of COVID. So let's hope for flattening the curve and bringing down this incredible uptick that we're seeing, it's, it's really, it's exponential growth. I mean, we are seeing increases of 10% per day, every single day in the hospital. If we keep going like this with no flattening, we could exceed the available bed capacity in as early as two weeks. Now, I'm very hopeful that we will start to see a bend in the curve. I believe that people will get it. I know San Antonio can put the mask on, um, but this is a critical time for people to come together and take this very seriously. Dr. Ruth Berger and UT Health San Antonio, appreciate you answering our questions and our viewers' questions. Hope to see you next Thursday. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. We'll be right back.